2021 Board of Education meeting for the Cedar Rapids Community School District. The meeting is now called to order. Do we have a motion to approve the agenda? I move that the agenda of Monday, September 13th, 2021 Board of Education meeting be approved as set forth and that each item is considered ready for discussion and or action. Is there a second? Second. This is a roll call vote. Director Garlock. Aye. Director Taminski. Aye. Director Newman. Aye. Director Riesinger. Aye. Director Borchardine. Aye. Director Mershkrak. Aye. President Humble. Aye. Next we'll turn to, the super, to Superintendent Bush for her report. Thank you very much, President Humbles. Good evening, Board of Directors. And it is indeed September. I want to start off with a sincerest congratulations to Roosevelt Corridor Career Business Academy and Kenwood Leadership Academy who have joined our ranks of certified magnet schools. This is a huge endeavor. It takes years to make this happen. And so just very proud of the efforts of all of our staff members, all of our students and families, and the leaders of our schools to make that happen. So congratulations, RCCBA and KLA. Great efforts there. Um, additionally, this is really just a reminder to the board as well as our community. We have um, several relationships with the city in which our students can use their student IDs for free access. One of those free access is uh, as a city bus pass, and so they can all ride our transportation. But as a reminder, this also couples as their public library card. So that's just for families as a reminder as well. All Cedar Rapids Community School District students can use their student ID as a public library card to gain access. They could also have a, their own personal library card, but I just wanna say a shout out to um, our local library to making that happen, which makes it really easy for kids and families to check out books and other media items, quite frankly. And then finally, Kingston Stadium. We have been underway, games are underway. Thank you for community members for supporting um, the Friday night excitement and Thursday night excitements that have happened out at Kingston. Just as a reminder um, to our families that elementary middle school students do need to be accompanied by an adult when attending Kingston Stadium. And thank you for those continued efforts. We are very proud, as you know, we unveiled the newness of our stadium uh, just over a year ago and are still really um, excited about the use of that facility. And so safety efforts are still um, uh, very important to us. And part of that safety is supervision of students. And so we do appreciate the assistance of adults to supervise our younger kids when out at Kingston Stadium, our shared facility. And those are the major updates I have for you tonight. We have several agenda items, so I'm keeping it fairly short. So thank you. Thank you. President Humbles. Are there any board reports? Okay, we'll move on to communications, delegations, and petitions. Uh, board Secretary, do we have any speakers registered to address the board this evening? Yes, President Humbles and board members, we do. Before we hear from those who have requested to address the board, I'd like to remind you to please state your name and address for the record when called. You will be given up to five minutes for your remarks. Board Secretary Day will serve as your timer and inform you when your time is up. Additionally, in order to abide by the open meeting law, I'd like to remind our speakers that there will be no dialogue between board members the public during this time except to clarify the nature of the questions or comments from the individual speaking. Laurel, would you please call the first speaker? Uh, our first speaker this evening is Daniel McGrail. Daniel, if you would please make your way to the podium and he is here to speak with the board this evening about civil society. Just a short comment, Dan McGrail, 3324 Wedding Roads, Cedar Rapids. I just encourage the board to support those institutions which really support our civil society, our schools, of course, firefighters, democratically affected, elected officials, and of course, the police. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. McGraw. Our next speaker this evening is Craig Seeley, Jr. Craig is here to speak to us about ideologies, agendas, and teaching methods. Um, I live in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and 
I'm thankful for this opportunity. Um, I want to address the um, super, the honorable superintendent, the president of the school board, and all the other people that are here. The good Lord gives me the power to love every one of you. And I want you to know I hate racism with a passion. It seems like our history is pretty much people mistreating people. So now we have a new theory coming out. It's called CRT. But I think it needs another letter. I call it CRST, Critical Race Suspect Theory. I'm not even sure if, if it makes a good hypothesis. We had a theory in the past. It was called Darwinian Evolution. And the European universities in the 1930s were addressing, were embracing Darwinian evolution almost completely. Well, it, all it did was reinforce Hitler's Mein Kampf and Aryan race theories. And by the way, between 1933 and 43, the Hitler regime killed more than 11 million people. So we have to be very careful about the theories or the hypotheses that we deal with in our teaching methods. So I would like to get into this a little bit deeper. Consider this a psychology lab. And, and but consider three things. This is the way we should look at people instead of yellow, red, white, and black. Because I was an art major, and I've never seen a person that is of the pure essence of any of those colors. I've never seen one on the face of the earth. A very wise person said, what we really are are different shades of brown. So we have we could remove those four colors when we're talking about humanity, and then people wouldn't be able to manipulate those four colors for power, money, and votes. Maybe this school um, district could set a precedent, a starry decisis, and quit using red, yellow, white, and brown. So, we look at people as different shades of brown. And light brown, medium brown, and dark brown. And so it, it is just a lot better way of looking at people. But considering this as a psychology lab, this is what I want you to consider. The light brown people are the oppressors if you believe in CRST. The medium brown people, maybe they're oppressors and maybe they're being oppressed. And the dark brown people, according to CRST, are being oppressed. Well, what are we doing here in the first place if we're oppressors? We shouldn't be dealing with young people. And if we're being oppressed and, and being an oppressor too, we're probably messed up a little bit, or a lot, and we probably have a bias, so we shouldn't be here either. And if we're dark brown people and we're being highly oppressed, which is an abomination, we're probably really messed up and we shouldn't be dealing with children either. That's the fruition of this ridiculous theory. And we should really consider this. We have all been canceled in this room if we let this theory go to fruition. We have no business dealing with children. That is how theories can become extreme. And we shouldn't allow them in our society without really thinking about the end result. 
So you, please you. consider Thank that. You. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Our next speaker is Danny Levy. Danny is here to speak about SROs. Good evening. Um, my address is 1351 21st Avenue, Southwest 5404, Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Um, Two fine gentlemen recently just told me, I'm not kidding, like 10 minutes ago, said that if I keep yelling in one place, then obviously they're not going to listen to me. And I, they do have a point. And I have, to un I have to let you know, when I first decided to come up here tonight, I thought I was just going to holler and yell and scream and bang my fists everywhere, even though I understand that the SRO issue has already been decided upon, possibly even far before we even brought it up. However, when I stand up here, I have to let you know that I am not speaking as an individual. My experiences do not reflect everybody who is within the school district. Furthermore, when we come up here and we talk about everything that we want to see change, obviously we're not doing it for ourselves. Within a year, the SROs won't mean nothing to me. I'll graduate. I'll probably be the high tail out of Iowa, if I'm being honest with you. I sure hope so, at least. But when it, when it comes down to it, as a senior, not only, but also as somebody who wants to see better, I realize that not everybody is willing to come up here. And that's all right. I, I get it. I am shaking right now as we speak. <laughs> but f you got to do what you got to do. And w SROs should not be in, sc in schools due to the fact that children should not be policed. It's terrifying. As I said last time, I there is no reason for us to have to sit in our psychology classes and realize that there's a police officer fully armed right outside the door. I, I can't focus with it. I can't think straight. I don't know what the answer is between A, B, C, and D. I honestly couldn't tell you what the question says because when I think about life and death, I also don't think about schools. Unfortunately, that is a situation of which we have been presented with, though. And so what I ask of you today for the school board is I hope you can realize that this issue is far beyond you. It's far beyond me. It's far beyond the school. We're going to set a precedent. Can you imagine? We could change the entire nation with this. Every change starts small. And everything that has ever impacted this world starts in a room much like this. And I hope you guys can realize that it's far more important than me and you and anybody in between because it's everybody. You guys represent the collective. And I understand that you guys have the best interest in mind for every single student within the school district. And I hope you realize that this is going to carry on far longer <laughs> um, than however long any of us will be here. And however long I'll be up at this podium, however long you guys will be, be in those chairs. Uh, so thank you very much for your time. Uh, I can't wait to hear the decision. And uh, I hope you guys have a good night. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lawrence Winklowski. Lawrence is here to speak about school board meetings in Chapter 2. Lawrence Winklowski, 4234 Morrell Road, Northeast. The Chapter 2 is my continuous presentation on this topic. Oh. Um, I keep bringing this up about school board meetings, not as an insult to our current school board, but because over the years, I honestly and truly believe changes need to be made in, in the way we have school board meetings. I have a question for everyone here. How many people here would rather speak after um, Superintendent Bush made her presentation versus speculate? about what she's going to say. Yeah. Raise your hand if you would rather. Lawrence, this is an opportunity to address the board. Oh, uh, it's Thank part you. of my, uh, anyway, sorry you feel that way. But anyway, uh, I go through the board meeting and uh, uh, re um, agenda in that. And one thing I see is board reports are before communications. They should not be, they should be after communications. Why? So you just don't do something that'll get you in trouble, like make a comment about communications and that. Because what happens is, if someone makes a, f a complaint to the state, Laurel gets in has to deal with it, not use. And Laurel doesn't like dealing with complaints to the state. Trust me, I know. And plus, it costs a lot of money. 
And uh, so, you know, in this way you can comment on people. Um, I've also wrote uh, one thing. I wrote a couple letters to you uh, about asking for feedback on this subject. I got one letter, which was basically thanks for your input. Uh, another thing is, you know, use approve a consent agenda. All the oh, oh, with communications, delegations, and petitions, and that. When you have a topic, and it get a lot of people here. Why not ask people not to repeat what someone else said? Just come up here and say, yeah, I agree with the previous things. The one advantage to doing that is that sometimes when everyone's saying the same thing, you miss what the one individual who says something different is. And, that, and sometimes that's very important. Um, and this way it also can eliminate it from dragging on. Um, another thing is uh, with the consent agenda. I, I think would appreciate it if in one of the year board reports, someone explains to me how, what the process is for you to get information that approves a consent agenda. Because obviously you are getting a lot more information than is presented to us. And that if you have questions, we don't see them unless I do a, a Freedom of Information Act request, which I'm not going to do, and that. Um, and then, you know, the one thing that really um, I'm disappointed with in the school board is the way you use Robert's Rules of Order. That is the one tool that you have that is to your advantage. You can cons keep your consent to your agenda the way it is every day, if you have a lot of people who want to talk or about a particular item, you can have change the agenda in the meeting with Robert's Rules of Order. You can give people more time to speak, and that because there are times you want people to know what the, the basis of the topic is instead of speculating on what you, uh, what someone's going to say, and that and that is something very very um, important and um, you know back in college uh, you know I took a class on uh, parliamentary procedure and Robert's Rules of Order and we sort of used it in different organizations and it was more so to try to outwit somebody you know it was sort of a game oh, I know this and but you know it, it's a big book you don't have to use it all only have to use the very basic. Go online, look for some classes on it or some videos. Uh, I gave Laurel once, and I know she's sent it out to previous boards, just a cheat sheet about what to do. And it's, you know, it's something that came from the Iowa Association of School Boards. So please, um, make some changes or, you know. Excuse me, Mr. Wachowski, your so time thank is you. up. Thank you. Our next speaker this evening is Wilsey Colley. Uh, Wilsey is here to speak with the school board about school resource officers, police. Thirty-five hundred Edgewood Road, Northeast Apartment One Hundred Two, Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Hello. I watched a SRO place their hand on a gun while confronting a black student over something minor. This is what I spoke at June board meeting. So this is a systemic issue that is affecting the majority of your kids here in the Cedar Rapids School District. This is affecting us black kids. I wrote a poem during the time of George Floyd's death where people were all a part of ending a racist system, doing whatever to make themselves not look racist. It shouldn't take one of our black bodies dead to make you speak up and make a change. So let me read my poem for you. Police say they're here to protect us. They make kids believe what they are is what we should want to be, but it's just a lie just like America. And instead of bearing our worries, they're bearing our bodies away. Black bodies on the floor and they don't even have a damn thing to say. It's a disgrace. 
Let me put it to your face because honestly, I couldn't know how to make it much clearer than this. Bullet wounds, bullet scars, every day it's a war, making it a chore for us to clean up the mess they made? Huh, funny you say. Huh. For us, the truth of the American dream was never built on freedom. It was built on the blood of the oppressed who are fighting to hopefully wipe their tears away. We choose to let our anger flourish. We fight with the flames that burns us in our veins every day. We riot, we riot, and they call us insane. We pray, we hashtag, we kneel, we take a stand, we raise our fists, we don't resist, we peacefully protest, and they still have a problem with it? What is it, America? Are you scared of our power? Because you're surely doing a lot to keep us silenced. I hope that helped you in what I feel like with the school system and everything that's going on with SROs and seeing a police officer, especially with me being a black student, in full um, attire and everything. So thank you for letting me speak. Thank you for your time, and I hope that you have a great day. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tracy Ingalls. Tracy is here to speak about a bus driver drop-off without a parent. <coughs> 948 21st Avenue Southwest Cedar Rapids um, the first week of school uh, my daughter first of all I'm the grandmother of Liam Hartle and um, my daughter couldn't be here because she's working <clears throat> but Friday August 27th there was an early dismissal and by chance I had picked up my grandson earlier from Jackson Elementary approximately 320 um, I found out that he wasn't in Kids Point at the after-school daycare program where he was supposed to be I checked with his mom and dad and found out that yeah, he, he was supposed to be there. So I pulled Mr. Duffy and Miss Merrill out of a meeting. Miss Merrill is his teacher um, and kindergarten, kin kindergarten teacher. Um, she had gotten a note in her mailbox saying that he was supposed to ride the bus home and he transferred over from an AK program over in Viola Gibson. So first week of school, it just automatically transferred over. Um, she had been gone the first few days of school, so there was a substitute which um, she had sent him to the daycare. But then Liam had been sick that Wednesday and Thursday, so he was kept home. And then on that Friday was the first day that they met up um, together and had, that, had their first day of school together. So Mr. Duffy right away went and called the bus barn. Um, my daughter left work to come over, and um, she was worried about the situation. And we were told that by the bus barn that Liam had been dropped off at his apartment complex where there was no parent present and according to Liam he was the only one um, getting off the bus that day it was right off of Edgewood Road a very busy road there's lots of wooded area and a river close by his apartment was also about a block away from where he was dropped off so we ran out of the school frantic and there was a search party that was immediately put in place um, to go find him. A neighbor had found Liam wandering around a parking lot and um, we, by the time we got there, they had, she had walked him down to where he was supposed to be about a block away. Um, I, we immediately brought him back to the school to let Mr. Duffy know that he was all right. And then we went to the bus barn over right here, um, which was just after four o'clock and met with the administrative. We were told that an investigation was started and that they would be talking to the bus driver. I followed up um, with Ms. Merrill that Monday morning to find out that there was no daycare roster put into place by the daycare, so they didn't have any idea of who, what kids were supposed to go where. I followed up with Mr. Duffy to find out why this automatic transfer had taken place, and at that time he did not know why. Um, but was going to check into it. Um, and then on Tuesday, uh, my daughter had talked to Scott from the bus barn about the investigation, and all he could tell us is that it was sent to HR, and we don't know of any reason why the driver um, did it or any reprimands that were put into place. And then September 2nd, I talked to Lisa at Kids Point the manager over there uh, about why there was no roster and about better communication. So what we would like to see done, first of all, we want answers. We want to know why the bus driver left my grandson when they know better <laughs> without a parent and what's going to be done 
it's been three weeks and we still have no answers. Then we want to know about the automatic um, school transfers for the bus when my daughter never signed anything to uh, say it was okay. I mean, people move and stuff. It shouldn't automatically be transferred over from other schools. And we also would like to see better communication with Kids Point and these after school programs about, you know, maybe updated rosters um, sent to the teachers quarterly or monthly or something to say which kids are supposed to go where. Um, but we would like to have answers on those things. And it's like I said, it's been three weeks and I think that's a ridiculous amount of time to, to know what really happened. So thank you. I hope you will look into this and get back with us. Thank you. Our next speaker is Diedrich Doolin uh, with Cedar Rapids NAACP, and he is here to address the board about SRO. Good evening, and thank you for giving me an opportunity to speak. Um, I just want to uh, encourage you. I have, I have one key word for you tonight, and I want you to think real hard about that, and that is investment. Invest in our students. Investment in our students. Invest in the education of all students. Every student should be your concern. The, the, the funds that the school district uses should be invested. I've been in this school district. I graduated from the school district. I challenged the school district and the, and the Board of Education when I was in school. So I appreciate some of the youngsters. But the concern I have is some of, the, some of the challenges are still here, and I was here decades ago. I didn't, just, I didn't just get here today. I was here decades ago. You know, I think some of y'all, some of y'all need to understand that the Emancipation Proclamation happened in what, 1863? Y'all know that? And then Juneteenth had to happen because the word didn't get communicated. But then the 14th and 15th Amendment, how many, let's, let's think about this for you that know women didn't even have the right to vote in this country at, at some time. I don't know if you all have ever seen the original Star Spangled Banner, but go look at it. You would be shocked at what you see the original Star Spangled Banner said, because it don't say what it says now. But I want to challenge you to invest in our students. You know, I would like to see the school district put more money to train so that the staff can work with students. Staff, administrators, teachers, and educators can work with all students, regardless of their race and color. Let's be, let's be honest. That's not the way that things happen right now. Not, not everybody can work with all the students. Some teachers only know how to teach a subject, but they don't know how to communicate with every student. And that's something that needs to happen. When we talk about SROs, the police department needs to take some of that investment too, because they need to invest in communicating with all young people and all people, because that don't happen. The police department can take some of the funds they're using to put SROs in schools and invest in building relationships with people, and they shouldn't have to have the school district to build that relationship. They should be building that relationship. And I had this communication with the police department as, as well, but we need the police department to invest in working with people and all people. Let's be real. Some of the students the police department can work with, and some they have a good relationship, and some they don't. You had a student come up and say about that. Anyway, invest in our kids. Invest in the education. That hasn't been happening. Look at, if you took some of these funds and put more of it to invest in building relationships with all students, we would have better schools. Teachers and administrators need to invest it. You know, some people don't have a color conscious. They don't recognize color, but that's not really true. When you first meet somebody, you know if they're a man or a woman, you recognize what color they are. But I tell you what, most people in Iowa, if you took them to Harlem at midnight, they'd all of a sudden realize there's a difference in color, all of a sudden. You know, so we just need to, we need to invest. I'm going to come back and keep saying invest. I want you to invest in our students. I used to supervise uh, clinical therapists and, and, and counselors, and one of the things I had to teach them, communication is important, listening. How well have you listened to the community? You know, one of the, one of the things to show that you really care about people is how well do you listen? So, but the decision that the school, school district makes tonight or whenever you make your decision will tell us how well you listen to the community or do you just do what you plan to do anyway without listening to the community. Listen to the community. Have all of our students in mind. Invest in our students. Invest, put more money in investing and in making the school educational experience for all students better for all students. One again, invest in our students. If you haven't heard me say that yet, invest in our students. Put your money where your mouth is. 
Why are some of the problems that the school district had when I was in school still here? Doesn't make any sense. So where's the investment going? I, I understand you all say school, our children are important. If they're important, put the investment there, train the staff, train the administrators, because if staff and administrators could handle and deal with some of the problems and, and not give them to the police department, we wouldn't have some of the problems. And if the police department improved their communication, invest in our students and invest in our community is what we have to do in this community. So I'm hoping that you will, will be committed to invest in our students and do what's best for all students, not just some students. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker this evening is Tanya Johnson, representing CREA. She's here to speak about the start of the year. Thanks for letting me go after Diedrich. That's awesome. <laughs> Tanya Johnson, president of CREA, uh, 3816 Riverside Drive. Uh, dear board members, first of all, this is the first time I've had a chance to talk this school year, so I'm kind of excited about it. Um, we've had 14 school days, three of those, three weeks of school under our belts, and in the buildings, people will tell you it feels like it's been so much more than that. Many of us were so excited to return this year. Um, in August, we came back to the same uncertainty, and it's been really difficult for our teachers as well as other staff members. Last Tuesday, I helped out in a preschool room as a one-on-one -on -one para. Uh, it was awesome. I had a great time. Those four-year-olds are so fun. It made me miss my kindergarten days. Um, the teacher was missing her classroom para and three one-on-one -on -one paras. Luckily, I was there, and another pair came in to help. We had a great day with the four-year-olds, feeling the excitement of the first day for them and learning new routines and making friends. However, the teacher, who did an awesome job inside, was struggling with how her special ed friends were going to get what they needed with the one-on-one -on -one pairs that were missing. And then she was struggling with how her gen ed friends were going to get what they needed when she was trying to help out the special ed students. Um, I encourage you all to visit our buildings as much as you can or more than you can to see what's going on in our classrooms, to see how our teachers are missing those really important paras that aren't there. The district employment page still shows over 60 para openings. Some of the most needy children are being covered by a shell game of moving paras from one building to another building. The stress of this is making more pairs decide to leave our district and take jobs that aren't as stressful and pay better than what they are doing now. <coughs> On top of the teachers needing pair support that isn't there, there are questions about how we were dealing, dealing with COVID cases in our buildings. I'm happy to see a little bit of a report today from Noreen on um, some of those mitigations and I know some questions will be asked then. Our buildings that have over 10% of their students absent, not all from COVID, but that is a lot of students that are gone. How are we going to gain back the lost learning if we don't have our students in school? Other questions that have been shared with me, one of them is about the sub shortage. This has been a continuing, continuing problem. Um, what are the expectations of our buildings when we are down a certain number of core staff? In our contract, it says that teachers can cover during their prep time, but we need our prep time to, to be able to plan for the learning that has to take place. So again, it's a, one of those problems that um, it's hard to find a solution for without the people and the manpower that we need. Um, another question that was brought to me was, we have letters that are going home to families when there is a COVID case. Um, however, it seems like when these letters go home, nothing else happens in the buildings um, and nothing is done differently in the building. So we wanna know what's gonna, what those letters mean and what that can do to help. And the other question, which I think is, is being taken care of, but is about cleaning. Um, some of our teachers are feeling like they need to clean their own buildings. They need to Lysol. They need to wipe down desks. Um, and last year we had a really good cleaning program that was put in by, with our custodians and just making sure that we know that that's, that's continuing and that it's happening in all of our buildings. Um, so, again, thank you so much for letting me have this opportunity to share some of our needs of our teachers and our staff. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to work closely with the district on many problems, and um, I know that you're always open for me to reach out to you as well. So thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Julie Casey, 
uh, representing a local group. Hello, my name is Julie Casey. I am with a local group. And we are just curious and um, wanting to give some information. We hear a lot from the board about the CDC and the FDA, and I'm here just to kind of straighten some facts out about some of the fraud that's going on with it. We are concerned with COVID. We are concerned with what's going on in our hospitals as well. So what I want, oh, I'm in Marion, Iowa. I do have family in this district. Um, some of the things I'm really concerned with is the protocols going on in the hospitals right now. Remdesivir is a drug that's given in the hospitals. Remdesivir is a drug that was not FDA approved until recently, so it was used as an emergency authorization drug. It has many side effects. There's two trials that were done on remdesivir during the Ebola outbreak, and this was you know, in Africa. And some of the serious side effects are multiple organ failure, acute organ failure, septic shock, acute renal failure, hypertension, and pulmonary edema, which is basically fluid in the lungs. There is some trial studies that were done for remdesivir. The NIH did give these trials. One of them was in 2020, and it was an NIH trial. 30% of participants got renal failure, 54% of participants died. This is with this drug. Study was six months long and suspended because of deaths by the safety board. And there was a Gilead study, which makes Remdesivir, that is the company that makes it. It had 53% participants, 23% of them received serious complications. The study was suspended. 8% had to be taken off medication at day five because of serious safety issues. It does stop kidney function in people, which produces such fluid retention in the lungs that it actually makes difficulty breathing. And that's why the safety issues came with the trials and they were suspended. It's the only protocol allowed in hospitals at this time. So if you go into the hospital today, you will be getting remdesivir, just so you know. Um, Dr. Kerry Malus, the PCR test creator, said the test was never meant to be used to identify infectious, this is the creator, to identify infectious disease and said that the cycles used were too high. It's a model, not a live sample, it's a model. And you we're the only country in the U.S. that uses remdesivir. <clears throat> and has one of the, we have one of the highest COVID deaths. Mitozolam is another drug that is used on the protocol list that when you go into the hospitals. Now, these are government-run hospitals, not necessarily your private. They are open to, you know, other protocols, therapeutics, whatever they want to use. But Fauci's wife is on the NIH board to approve the vaccine. Her name is Christine Gray. That's a conflict of interest. It shouldn't happen that way. We shouldn't have wives that approve drugs for an NIH for Dr. Fauci. That is, just should not be. But this particular drug, mitozolam, causes breathing problems. Now, people with COVID go in with breathing problems. They shouldn't have a drug with known side effects that causes it, plus a drug with renal failure that causes retention of fluid in your lungs, which eventually presses against the heart and they die. That's why 54% participants of that study died. So Janet Woodcock, the acting chief, the FDA chief who approved OxyContin and fentanyl, the two drugs that led to mass deaths is now in charge of approving the COVID shots. So that's another conflict of interest. Ivermectin costs pennies. Resdesivir costs $3,000 a round. It creates a lot of money for big pharma. Plus there's kickbacks if you put a COVID patient in as COVID. Doctors are getting kickbacks. So many peer-reviewed, randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trials were done for ivermectin. It's been around for 30, 25 years with 16 total deaths for that drug. So I would say it's safe. Remdesivir kills over half the people it treats, and vaccines have killed in only months 13,000 on VAERS. Do you guys know what VAERS site is? It's the you know, vaccine accident reporting system site. VAERS is, that's what it is. It's 1% accuracy. And they estimate the accuracy of it should be about 45,000. But a lot of people don't know about VAERS. Even some doctors don't know about VAERS. They're not aware of it. So they're not reporting to VAERS. That's why they say it's about 1%. 
the other information I have, I'll have to do the next time, but I am really concerned with some fraud going on with the FDA and with the NIH. And I will get you the alert next time. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our final speaker to address the school board this evening is Anthony Arrington, and Anthony was uh, wanting to address you about SRO. Thank you all, Anthony Arrington, 1311 34th Street Southeast, Cedar Rapids. Uh, wasn't going to speak, but changed my mind. You, you all have a tough job to do, and I'm not up here to say that I'm in your shoes, but you signed up, and so you have to take the arrows. Having said that, I'm also not up here to complain. I can do that all day long, but we've got to have a solution, right? right? We're solution-based people. So here's my solution for your SROs. This is a great idea. Our concern is with relationship building. Our concern is that we're going to remove the, chi the, the SROs from the school and we're going to impact the relationships. Let me tell you about that. <clears throat> we do STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. We have programs. We invest money. We invest time. We invest resources to prepare kids for those skill sets. We prepare kids for the trades, which we've been lacking in this country but we've begun to increase our focus on the trades again. How do we prepare kids for the trades? When I was in high school and still to this very day, and when my Uncle Diedrich was in high school and still to this very day, there's ROTC programs. We prepare students to go to war. They gotta be 21 to drink, but they can go kill somebody when they're 18. And we're recruiting them in schools. We bring recruiters into schools to train kids to recruit kids to go to the military. I think it's a great thing. I don't have any problem with that. Why don't we have any programs for law enforcement? Hmm. Why don't we have a curriculum for law enforcement? Let's figure out how to build relationships. Let's put a curriculum together. And let's have an officer come and teach. There was a girl here last month from Jefferson who talked about her relationship with that police officer. And she learned about how to be a police. And she's a volunteer officer. How many times can we scale that if we took that $950,000 that we're paying people to walk around with guns and pay an educator to come and teach law enforcement to kids who want to study that? You build relationships. You have an officer in school a few days a week when you need them. They're not there to protect. They're there to teach. They're credentialed. They're educators just like any other teacher. Seems like a pretty good solution to me, pretty good compromise to me. Because the alternative is you're going to continue to traumatize. And when we talk about traumatization, we have this, you know, thing that, oh, my God, if kids aren't traumatized. I don't see them screaming and running down the halls and yelling. Trauma happens every day that in ways that we don't know. And I'm not a psychologist. I don't get paid to do that. But I can tell you personally the traumatization of being caught by a police officer, talked to by a police officer in front of your homeboys or your friends, and what that does to you psychologically when you go home at night, and now I have to explain to your family and your parents or what happened at your school while everything else is going on at home that you have to deal with. And somewhere in the middle of that, you've got to figure out homework and how to come back to school the next day. That's trauma that you, you can't measure in your little metrics. You can't measure in your little reports. The other thing I was taught in business is when you look at metrics, because we are a metrics-driven organization, you want to make sure you pay attention to those outliers, right? Here's the masses. Right? It's easy. When the masses are homogenous, it's easy to make decisions based on the masses. But are you paying attention to the fringes, right? What's happening out the fringes? The fringes are the low percentage of black and brown people that look like me, statistically, are the fringes that are having the most negative impact. So I beg of you, I ask of you, we can find a compromise. I don't hate police, but there's a way to use police officers without guarding children like prisoners. That's what it's doing. So let's look at that. Let's look at a curriculum. A few days a week, a few credits, right? We can, students can get credit for learning how to, about law enforcement. Maybe a higher percentage of them will want to go in law enforcement. I heard somebody say to me, well, you know, you might embarrass, you know, kids that want to go in law enforcement might be embarrassed. You know what? I've been embarrassed looking at nerds with pens in their jacket. We've been hearing that story about kids and embarrassment all of our lives. This is life. This is life. I'm not concerned about whether a kid's embarrassed because they're going to go into law enforcement and other kids in the school see them. What about the black kids who are embarrassed because they got pulled into the office for disrupting class or whatever? 
white kid, blue, brown, black. That's a solution, people. That's an investment in money. That's an investment in education. That's an investment in our community. That's an investment in law enforcement. And that's not cops walking around the school with guns like police. So I say you think about that and think about where we're investing our money. Because if I was a CEO and I didn't have any results to show for my 900 million plus dollars that I've been investing, I would try to figure out another way to invest that money. If I was in the corporate world, I might lose my job. Thank you. That concludes our speakers for this evening. Thank you. Uh, we will now move on to our consent agenda. Are there any items that a board member would like to pull for a comment, question, or for a separate vote? Uh, do we have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Is there a second? Is there any further discussion? at all this is a roll call vote director mershbrock Aye. director borchardine Aye. director reesinger director newman Aye. director timinski Aye. director garlock Aye. president humbles uh, the next item is an update from superintendent bush uh, on our health and safety mitigations Thank I turn you. it over to you. Thank you, President Humbles. And um, the, the conversation continues, certainly, and how we are managing, everyone, how all of us are managing COVID-19. So all along as uh, what we've, how we've done this as a district, as new information arises, we continue to monitor, respond, and communicate accordingly. So. Uh, some of the questions that have surfaced uh, most recently in the past couple of weeks have been around COVID testing questions, and that is access to COVID tests. So as communicated in our last board meeting, our staff members have had access to COVID tests. We have um, implemented, by having those accessible in our schools, staff members can take the test with them. They are the ones who implement it and they are the ones who mail it into Test Iowa site. We are now working with um, a new procedure with the Department of Education to make um, Iowa test kits available, more available. Uh, supply and demand did become a little bit of a crunch for us as a district and so as all districts are faced with that, um, getting access. So we are going to continue to gain access to the Test Iowa kits. They will be available for our staff and our team, mitigation team just met today and how we can make those available also for students. We would not be the implementers of those tests. They would be available for families to gain access via our health offices to pick up and to utilize at home and to mail in to test Iowa. And then the results would come to the family. There are some heavy procedures that a school district would have to implement to be diagnostically um, certified for those tests. So we're just going to continue at this point in time to make the tests available. But we've had increased requests of how we might be able to make that available, not just to staff, but also to students. So we're gonna be working on that. And the Department of Education has a process and a procedure where we can request those tests to be available for staff and for students. Secondly, um, new information today. I got the information about four o'clock, probably the same time as others in this room, that there was a ruling today uh, regarding um, the mask mandate. And so a federal judge has granted a temporary injunction to stop the state from enforcing its ban on the mask mandate. And so this means that schools uh, will have to revisit uh, what, they're, what they choose to do in regards to the umbrella of the law. So that's House File 842. We have not um, uh, met as a team just yet, nor has information from the Department of Education been issued at this time. But as we've done with all new information, we get the information, we look at the guidelines that are now presented in front of us, and make sure that we're informing our community and the board as quickly as possible. So we will be flexible, we will continue to respond, and of course, safety continues to be our priority. I imagine there might be some questions about that ruling and what that means in regards to face coverings or mask mandates. I would certainly be open to the board's questions at this time. 
Um, and again, knowing that we don't have additional guidelines, but what that might mean for our school district. So that is my update at this point in time and certainly would be open to the board's questions. Does the board have any questions? Uh, Director Garla. A uh, couple questions. Uh, first, the testing both for staff and for students that we're running through Test Iowa. Do I'm a little concerned about the turnaround time. Do we know how long that typically takes? And is that problematic in our mitigation strategy? So um, just to be clear in regards to the accessibility of the test, I would say this is for any individual they can go to their you know provider to try and maybe get a quicker test for us and what we can do under the department of education this is the accessibility that we have for the tests and so the process really is we do lean on the state's turnaround time um, i do understand that it is potentially a couple of days to get that information i initially at the beginning of the year i think folks were hearing within 24 to 48 hours as i understand it it's even gotten delayed with our county um our public health um county departments um are getting delayed communication as well it's just getting more and more congested because of the number of cases or the number of tests actually being taken okay um, so i'm i'm sorry i don't have yeah, better no. information no on that's that. okay we're at the mercy of of other institutions to help us with that um, the second thing that i have to say is less a question and and more just a comment I think um, we as a board have made statements in the past regarding our position on masks. And as you meet with your team, I know personally, I very strongly encourage you to have a mask mandate for our students. I think the data is clear, the science is clear. Um, we want to provide a safe environment for all of our kids and the best way to do that is with a mask. Thank you, Director Garlock. There's no no voting or anything on this. We we understand no. that, but I, I think several of us uh, feel that way and and just want to have the opportunity to express that as well. Um, but a question on the testing. You say that the becoming a diagnostic. What'd you say? We we are not diagnostic. Right. We are not a certified clinician. Um, so our our nurses certainly. Um, um, might take temperatures and call home and say, hey, these are the symptoms we see and need to come pick up your child. But our nurses are not diagnosing, um, nor have they in the past diagnosed um, illness. So, so two questions on that. Um, do, we get, we do, do we get any notification or is it voluntary if a test comes back for either staff or for students? Lynn County Public Health communicates when there is a positive case. And so when we get that information, that's how, um, as in open comments tonight, the, one of the question was is um, around the letters that families receive. Those letters are issued because we have been either via a family or Lynn County Public Health has made us aware that there is a positive case. If they mail it into Test Iowa, Lynn County gets that information that and that they information identify And we they get that Perfect. information. Perfect. Yes. This is um, just like probably not possible, but, but is it possible for us to do preliminary testing just with the tests you can get at Walgreens? just to know any individual can do that we don't do that as we don't administer that as a school district but any person can do that and then also if anyone is symptomatic mm -hmm. we have encouraged folks to i to quarantine stay home or if you're testing positive that you we we uh, um, require that you stay home and isolate so essentially if somebody shows up with symptoms they're going to get sent home regardless right yes so Yes, okay. yeah, very good question. Um, I can't appreciate with this ruling today, like you said at four o'clock, that the administration will be meeting to see it, its business. This is how we operate, is to look at everything before we move forward. And, and, and I do appreciate that. And like Director Garlock said, you know, we as a board have already made a statement, so we the, will work through it, and you will get back to us. 
to everybody. Everybody's going to gonna wonder about this one. But yes, absolutely. <laughs> right. I, I would say that, um, that you know, we've been using um, data and information all along to make our decisions. The one thing that we know, and this was discussed at the board table um, in um, a, one of our most recent board meetings, that um, we understand the vulnerability to, to those who don't have access to vaccination, and that has been an increasing concern. And that is true for, obviously, children under the age of 12 and younger, and then even um, co compromised um, health condition um, folks. And so we absolutely want to keep um, safety of all uh, mm -hmm. paramount and know that those vulnerable populations will just so you know, be our first conversation. Um, but also what our data tells us as a school district, um, 90 plus positive cases um, that we've been able to document at this point in time, which is more than we had at any given point in time last year for sure, um, that is on our radar. Director Any Gar other questions? Director mm -hmm. Garland. Yeah, I, I have uh, one more just in regards to President Biden's uh, decision last week and the OSHA requirement that as an employer of more than 100 people, we would then, I assume, be requiring our staff to wear masks? So we, and that, and that entity as well, part of this was um, the conversation around our house file 842 and um, the communication from last week. We have not been given additional guidance on that either from our governing bodies. However, there could be an implication there, certainly Director Garlock, of, of what our expectations will have to be for our employer, as an employer as well. Yeah. Okay, who, who gives us that guidance? Well, usually we get our guidance from the Department of Education around uh, both from our uh, students as well as how we're uh, working with our employees. Uh, uh, Director Noggle's here tonight as well. Many times we also get it from other entities like Iowa Workforce Development, but we have not received that guidance as of yet. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Any other um, questions? We don't get that guidance from our state governing bodies assuming they don't necessarily agree with that guidance. Where else do we get that guidance Our attorneys. From? Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yes. So that's who we will also be checking in with. Who've already we've just know that this is on everybody's radar. So I will say, uh, not unlike any other um, Iowa school district, at four o'clock today, uh, this information came in really, really quickly, right. and so we will all be in these discussions. Um, we know our communities are counting on us to communicate quickly and are very curious about wh which direction school districts will go. Um, we have just tried to always maintain, get the best information, accurate information, and make decisions. Um, the board's voice has been really helpful and um, just can't say uh, how much we appreciate you and your guidance, so thank you for that. Director Murchbrath. Um, I just have a couple follow-ups on other questions uh, regarding tests. Um, is there any reason why a school nurse, I just administered a saliva test to my kid over the weekend and it was pretty easy if I could do it. Is there any reason why our nurses couldn't administer the test from Test Iowa? That, well, so the recommendation would be that we do exactly what you just described and put that in the hands of our families. We can get the test accessible and so that families have that accessibility, but at this point in time, you as a parent read that test and, and, dis and made a decision at this right. point in time, it, that under um, the um, Department of Education, if we were to go down that route, there's a lot that we would need to do to be officially the administers and the diagnostic folks for that. We just haven't done that at this point in time. Di what do you mean by diagnostic in this Reading situation? the test and reading the results and making a decision okay. from it. Okay. Is that separate from having the nurse administering it and sending it into the test Iowa to the state hygienic yeah, lab? And that really should be the responsibility of the parent to do. If if parents consented and said, "I want my kid to take a COVID test," and I would allow our student, our nurse at the school to do it, we allow the nurses to deal all sorts of things with students. And, and just from a healthcare standpoint, I trust the nurse more than I trust myself. They've got you know, training that I haven't had. So is there anything stopping us from doing that, I guess, is my question. It, it, it would be considered a diagnostic procedure. 
And so it, we, it, it, we, got, we are hindered from doing that unless we were to get that certification. Okay, and then following up on getting the turnaround time, like Director Garlock said, um, I talked to UPS man uh, that day. Is there a way that we could act at schools as a, assuming that the supply is there in the community, a drop-off point and then use you know some of the extra funds we've got right now to send because I as far as I know Lynn County is only sending stuff down like Tuesdays and Fridays is what I heard UPS if you catch them if you get there too late for the drop-off uh, point you might not get it there for a couple days even though it's just down to Coralville could we collect you know finished boxes from parents and send them daily down to Coralville to get that uh, you know an extra day faster results out to our families i i'm not sure i can check on that okay because we've everything around this we've got all the extra money that's coming in and that's that is a cost but just putting a bunch of little boxes in a van and, and taking just, them down and just for clarity when you're talking about cost the tests are free for us just so you know there's yeah. not there's not a cost for that yeah i'm with you yep um, oh so for the transport it for so it yeah rather back. than you know having to wait on ups or um something like that okay. i also wanted to ask about um we had talked earlier in the summer and even maybe as far back as last year about uh new filtration systems for our buildings yes. where do we stand with that are they in all buildings are we still working on no, it? no we are still working on that so that is the bipolar ionization uh, i will say this is we met similar um, circumstances with um our project any of our manufacturing projects right now our building projects we, it's a supply and demand thing as well because of manufacturing delays. So um, I know that John uh, Galbraith is here, but we are we have plans underway. I just need a nonverbal from you, and uh, we're continuing to work on that implementation. We are um, waiting for the supply to come to us. If we're we're just in such a high time in Lynn County and in Iowa right now, and a lot of places across the country, if there's anything that we can do on a temporary basis in terms of like smaller temporary filters. I, again, we've got the money um, coming in, and I know the money's not unlimited, but when you've got an extra $30 million coming into the district and you're at very high transmission in the community, and like you said, as many cases as we've ever had in our schools, um, anything that we can do now instead of waiting um, is something that I would support. And then the last thing I just wanted to say is following up on comments um, from my fellow board members. I wanted to make a comment on behalf of parents like myself, maybe parents of elementary school students who you know, aren't able to make a meeting like this, especially with the decision coming down at four o'clock. A lot of people weren't able to make it here, maybe to make a comment on uh, you know, what we're doing here tonight. And so I took a comment from a Lindsay Ellickson, whose daughter attends Johnson's Team Academy. Um, Lindsay wrote about how her family has sacrificed. They postponed trips to see family. Uh, they've worn masks to do their parts. Her and her husband got vaccinated because they both work in essential jobs, so they couldn't stay home. Their daughter, Addie, wore her mask. She never complained, and she did it so she didn't make others sick. And she wore it at daycare even when she was the only one. And Lindsay wrote that she's very concerned over the last month, and we've all seen it um, in the southern United States, the case numbers, school districts closing due to overtime, uh, due uh, due to quarantine, people getting sick and dying, and that's all harmful and traumatic to students. And so the final thing that Lindsay said was, she trusts the Cedar Rapids School Board in understanding the science of masking. We kept our mask mandate in place as long as we could until it was made illegal last year. The science is there, you can look to the CDC. It's a minimal sacrifice to save a lot of trauma. And she asks, and I would agree with this, that with the ruling today, that we reinstitute a mask mandate. Thank you. Any other questions for Superintendent Bush? I would just like to make a comment that I think that the way that the district has proceeded in, in a thoughtful manner to make sure that we are doing what we can to the utmost ability inside the law while protecting students and staff, um, being thoughtful and um, having foresight of, of looking at some consequences has been really beneficial. I appreciate the work that you've done and fully support you in efforts to move forward. Thank you. Any other comments from any board members? Seeing none, uh, thank you for the, the update and we'll be uh, waiting.
for an update. Everybody will be waiting. Everybody will be waiting. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> next, Superintendent Bush will now provide an update on the school resource officer program. All right, thank you very much. Uh, and this really is a synopsis tonight of where we are currently and then um, uh, maybe a, a, another opportunity for the board to give feedback um, prior to um, our meeting in two weeks from now. So we are providing tonight um, an update on uh, the what's happened so far over the past several months as we've done a program evaluation of our SRO program. So just for clarification, and, and I know you board members, you have received a lot of feedback and a lot of communication. Um, I, thank you so much to our community members who have continued to come to the podium, to email, to communicate, voice their opinions, concerns, and really, ultimately, it's advocacy for our children. And so thank you to everyone for the constant efforts. I would like to give a huge um, thank you to Deputy Superintendent Koiker, who has done a tremendous amount of work in leading this and presenting information to the board, and then uh, CRPD, who has also put in a tremendous amount of time and energy to collaborate with us through this process. So what has come clear to me is that, um, through the input, is that not everyone is clear of what's actually been uh, coming to the board, which is the proposal for a contract amendment. We started with a program evaluation last spring, which eloquently stated in one of our most recent meetings, President Humbles would, was really um, started with a lot of student voice and then also community voice, staff voice, et cetera. So then the comprehensive program evaluation came underway. That first presentation came in June and then another in July, and then some recommendations came to the board in August. Through the three board presentations over the summer, um, the process for input was reviewed, the data was reviewed, and then resulted in recommendations, which was at the most uh, recent board meeting. So that input from the community came through the Board of Education meetings, certainly through communications, delegations, and petitions, as well as through the listening sessions that happened throughout um, the summer as well, the, the two uh, listening sessions, and then survey input as well. But your input, um, Board of Directors, after all presentations, including the recommendations that were presented at the most recent meeting, uh, was critical. And so when we were, uh, when the questions came to Deputy Superintendent uh, regarding um, the actual contract, we are currently in a multi-year contract agreement with the city of Cedar Rapids, which ends and concludes at the end of this school year. So as the program evaluation was underway, we were making recommendations to the board to amend the current contract. So that's what would be coming to the board is a contract amendment um, based on all the aforementioned information. So as we look at what a contract amendment would include, um, again, it's a current multi-year contract. That contract ends at the end of this particular school year. When we're in multi-year contracts with partners, we uh, renew those or we choose to revise those or we reevaluate them. So because we're in a current contract that's a multi-year contract, we're recommending an amendment to that current contract based on the, the input we've had from the community and from our students and from all of you. Um, the majority vote, which, which will come to the board with an amended contract at our next board meeting, would approve or not approve an amended contract. Not approving an amendment contract would mean that the current contract remains as is, as it was written. So approving the amendment would mean the 14 recommendations that you gave us feedback on, that we are um, um, implementing um, into the new amendment, that would be what was coming to the board for approval. So I just wanted to make sure there was clarity um, around what's actually coming to the board table. Certainly, the board also can direct um, administration to reevaluate and to reconsider um, contracts. It is in any 2080 agreement, 
as uh, mutually agreed upon um, between the parties. We can terminate contracts within 30 days or services within a contract upon mutual agreement. However, usually you continue to pay for those services even if you choose to discontinue the service. So wanted to make sure that was also a point of clarity. So the contract amendment includes the recommendations that were made in August. That amendment, we're still working on the language together. Thank you for the patience. This is a very complex process. Uh, so all the input that the board had, uh, which also was reflective of community input, um, we're revising the language. So I've uh, been working together with our leadership team and with CRPD on that collaboration. There's always within a contract what we say is uh, good, goodwill, other, good faith efforts in order when there's questions or concerns that surface that we work together to um, meet, meet the agreement. So thank you for your feedback, which uh, also was the community input. Most of the edits to those 14 recommendations are really providing uh, clarity to what was already presented to the board in August. And we, again, are reviewing that with CRPD. But the recommendation that seems to have the most questions or feedback was around the middle school programming. So just to be clear, the recommendation from the 14 recommendations that came to the board was that we would have no school designated full-time SROs in middle schools. That means we would remove them from the current two middle schools where they preside. Therefore, that current FTE under a multi-year contract would be amended and that we would need to consider how those two FTEs serve in other capacities. Um, as was stated tonight, perhaps it's with proactive educational efforts, perhaps that is with responding to, we just recently had an elementary that there was a water main um, break within the neighborhood and we needed community support around that and who are our first responders in those cases. So we are looking to work with CRPD to redefine what those two roles would be under that current contract. The rest of those 13 recommendations that are not related to the middle school efforts, uh, you will see reflected in the contract amendment. So that is uh, what our focus is. So tonight, welcome further questions on the recommendations from the board. You have um, documentation of what those 14 recommendations were. Secondly, we have a meeting this week to complete the amended contract. So again, your feedback is important and we welcome that. And that the amended contract would come to the 7th, September 27th meeting and that also that amended contract would go to the city council meeting as well. So just as we're reviewing um, the language, the city's entities also review that language. So that is the summary of where we are and would welcome board's questions and feedback. I, I have a question when you said the amended contract will come to us as a board on the 27th. So when it, when is it sent to the city council? Will that be at the same Usually time? So both of them will see it before it comes to. So they will, they will be, um, you all will be given obviously your board agenda, it will be part of a consent agenda and you would be able to see that ahead of time just okay. as they would. So they, usually what happens is you all sign and then they sign and then the contract is completed. Other questions from board members? I, I have a few. Uh, my first one would just be kind of building on what you were asking, President Humbles. I, I'm curious what happens if the board approves the amendments but the city does not? So then we have to come back to the table and say, uh, so there's two options. One is do we reevaluate and we go through a process again that's mutually agreed upon uh, of language? Or then we, the other piece would be, and I'll just read what this says in any 28 agreement, is the agreement may be terminated by either party upon 30 days written notice. In the event that the agreement is terminated, compensation shall be made to the city or whatever entity we're working with for all the services performed to that date. So if we can't reach an agreement, usually in any contract, then you end up saying we can't agree. Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions from the board? Um, I have a question. Are the number of therapists in the schools right now, um, I think there's four, there's one in each high school and then there's support with therapists in the middle schools. Is that an increase over prior years? So we've had 
had a significant increase, I would say, over the last couple of years, and I'm gonna make eye contact with um, Deputy Superintendent, the exact number. I won't be able to give you a whole uh, number of FTE, but I do know this, it, it was an additional $500,000 um, last year of allocated funding for uh, mental health supports uh, throughout our system. But yes, there has been an increase um, de dedicated um, full-time uh, folks in our secondary buildings so yes and we continue to we allocated more of our ESSER dollars towards continued um, mental health supports so within that and I know we have great partners in kids first and foundation too and and all of those um, great entities are there more opportunities for um, uh, things like crisis counselors and more of the social work perspective rather than just the restorative justice approach because we've talked a lot about how the foundation is missing for a lot of kids. They're coming to school mm -hmm. hungry and they're coming to school with trauma. It's maybe more than just, you know, what a therapist and certainly an SRO should be, should be dealing with. Do we have plans to increase that partnership um, and um, allow for some of that crisis outreach? And so I'm going to, I'm not sure if you have a mic down there, but I think that, um, so there are some specific things that our culture climate transformation team have been working on in those specific efforts, but yes, we do, uh, have increased services. And so when it comes to beyond just restorative practices and our social emotional learning practices, uh, we do have, uh, additional efforts. I guess what we would say is more acute, um, services. So I'm going to ask Nicole. So interesting that you asked that because we've been having these conversations and we have actually a draft job description for social workers for our system and what could that potentially look like and have a follow-up meeting with a couple principals coming up later this week. So those are avenues we've been exploring even with the additional supports in place of how could we add those within our system, where could we pilot those, where should we start those. So we've talked just about potentially looking at the two middle schools that previously had the SROs. So yes. I'm gonna let somebody else have a turn. I have more questions, but. Well, I would just actually kind of like to build upon what you just said there, uh, Director Newman, and, and that is, do we know if other uh, partner agencies have capacity to fill those spots? I mean, do they have, I mean, every place is kind of in a hiring shortage right now, so I'm wondering if they're able to step in and provide support services. So I was speaking with one of our partner agencies about, um, uh, about our workforce uh, in in some of the areas that we were uh, struggling with, they too, um, you know, struggle uh, are struggling. However, um, they're they're very willing to. Um, I would just say negotiate where people go and that if we can use one agency here and another agency here and uh, we have partners who are sometimes just in one of our buildings and not in all of our buildings and so it's a matter of concentrating what they're um, able to do uh, I just spoke with a partner actually last um, Thursday um, who was talking about some different concerted efforts during the school day and still instead of after the school day um, to integrate and that they had the capacity to do that because of some of their employees were going to be more accessible during that time so I'm just so appreciative of all of them uh, being willing to work with us but yes they too need employees to do the work but not just um, having the employees it's having the employees who are trained and able to provide the support that are that's needed and some of this is just connectedness and opportunities for kids to just be connected I do have a question because I know we have counselors within our schools and our engagement specialists. Will we think about hiring more to, to work with the students? Because I mean, they have been trained too, our counselors mm -hmm. within our district to work with our, uh, with our students. I mean, that might be something we want to consider too. And like Director Borchardine said, you know, there is a shortage and so how, yep. 
how do we really serve all the needs of our students? Too? Yeah, so. school, school counselors, of course, are certified um, mm -hmm. staff members. Their certification is different than that of a therapist. Mm -hmm. And they're really coming from a school counseling point of, view, point of okay. view, which is the whole child, which is the academic component, and certainly social emotional components. Mm -hmm. um, but absolutely, that's a continued resource for us. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, engagement specialists, who uh, that is that is a unique position to Cedar Rapids. That mm -hmm. is not a position that you would find necessarily everywhere. They're used a little differently in each building. We some of our buildings did use their ESSER dollars to increase positions. That was one position that certainly surfaced um, in several of our schools as adding um, folks with that particular um, job description. So yes, okay. we have and we can continue to do that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions from the board? Newman. Okay, sorry, it's me again. Um, so. I remember, I, I think maybe earlier this year, um, our safety and security specialist um, took another position elsewhere. Have we, have we filled that? And do we have any intention of filling it? So at this time, um, that position was hired to reevaluate our crisis response, specifically um, enhanced run, hide, fight efforts. And so as that, um, the good news is, is the work really um, got under way or at least a plan for the work and now we're at the implementation part and so the bulk of that has happened this has actually been an enhanced conversation with our school resource officer conversation and that this is also an area of expertise for them is crisis response and so the proactive efforts of how to respond to um, um, crisis uh, the Cedar Rapids Police Department in the past has partnered with us many times in our schools for those presentations and trainings um, and they're very willing to continue that effort and even take that on a, a little bit more. We have not replaced that position at this point in time. I think what we'd like to do is continue to assess what the needs are as we're finding that that work, were, that what it was intended to do. We got a lot of outcomes from that and now we're at the implementation stages. And the ownership is really at that building level uh, with how they're implementing those plans at each building. Um. If the, if the recommendations are adopted or, or the contract is amended and the city and the school board comes to that agreement, what type of metrics will be available to us as the board and to the public to ensure that we're seeing both a decrease in the level of disparity in, in um, incidents and arrests? And certainly we have our eyes on arrests in general um, how do we know it's working, right? But on the other side of it, how do we know that we're also keeping our schools safe? Like, how do we know we're not going to suddenly see, how will we know if we're suddenly seeing an increase in, you know, the schools that are kind of used to relying on an SRO? So I think I'll start high level, and then if Debbie Superintendent, if you want to go to the mic again, that would be great. Um, so first and foremost, um, program evaluation that happened, um, over the past several months, that was really the point of clarity is one, and I think the questions from the board table, how does this align to our strategic plan work? How does this align to our system indicators and what are we doing to deliver on the promise of every child for every learner future ready? So our disproportionality that has existed in our academic data and our own discipline data, this is another piece of data where we are disproportionate. And that has been very clear from the onset of this strategic plan that was launched several years ago and the vision of this board and our school district is to um, eliminate that disproportionate measure. So we know that we have to uh, continue to update the board more regularly on not just arrests, but our own discipline data. And what does that, because we take the ownership and the responsibility for our schools and our staff and how we're supporting our students. And so whether that be with an SRO in the building or not, we own what happens within our schools and we have to take um, responsibility for that. So the data that would be coming to the board would be, be our own discipline data, as well as now um, we've worked out a system and a conversation with CRPD and how our teams will have that data in front of them and to really review and evaluate 
each and every conversation and all of that, those pieces of data. So we'll be keeping information in our own student information system and CRPDA is gonna be bringing their, um, their data to us as well. The next steps for us, so after the amended contract, let's just play this out. After there's an amended contract, we have um, a plan to get all of our teams together to say, all right, here's where we've been, here's where we are, and this is where we expect to go. And that includes having our own administrators and CRPD at the table in a collaborative conversation and then what does a collaborative conversation around data actually look like that's focused on results for students? In addition to that, we continue to need our student voices at the table of what's working and what is not working. Anything to add, Deputy Superintendent? <laughs> so you can expect to see reports from us. you for that any other questions director Mersh based on again I seem we seem to be working together here uh, based on what director Newman was saying um, and, and just kind of talking about the escalation process when we're looking at measurements um, in the past I mean you know what I'm gonna say right I'm gonna say shared practice right because in the past when we've looked at buildings and they're giving us escalation measures and they're giving us data their discipline data the escalation process to create that data in the first place is not hasn't always been the same from school to school to school so I'm, I'm really hoping that there's some common language and some shared practice there so that when we're getting the data it's reliable data that can be looked at across the system yep so that was um, some of what um, uh, director blitz was reviewing was some of the common terminology that we have now within our system and not just w having the common terminology but what actually gets recorded as well and documented so the documentation it, but shared understanding comes through conversations and so how I define a term and I'll say this I've learned this a lot through this whole process what I believe has been said or thought about is like not what's clear to someone else. And so um, the conversations are what makes that common understanding and shared practice. So that's the intent of those data conversations, um, at the, especially at the building level, but also that we're going to have at the system level that everyone understands. Good, that is good. Um, additionally, so as we continue and we're looking at evaluations and we're looking at at different measures of supports for students. I, I would like us, I would strongly recommend us to be very mindful that our staff also needs supports. Um, that when we're talking about changing an aspect of a system, I think it's important to understand what that meant to staff members that were operating with that and make sure that they have supports to help them be successful moving forward without they, what they'd previously kind of been uh, relying on or whatever that meant, whatever that meant uh, to them, just to kind of make sure that we've got our staff supported there. Um, and as we're, again, evaluating supports for students and staff, I think it's really integral for teacher voice to be a part of that conversation um, because nobody knows our students better than their teachers. Well, I mean, their parents do, but in our system, Nobody knows the student better than their teachers, so I think it's pretty important for that teacher voice to be included. Thank you. Director Mersh Brock, did you have a yeah. question? Yes. First, I'll just echo and agree with Director Borcherding um, about making sure we have support for staff and teachers. Um, what I wanted to ask was more just about the recommendations uh, themselves. I believe one of them is soft uniforms mm -hmm. in the buildings, mm -hmm. and we've heard quite a few comments about, and not for the first time um, here today, I heard another comment about the feeling of being patrolled with having that SRO in the hallway. 
And I'm wondering if there was ever any thought um, given to, because I don't know personally just how much time an SRO is actually spending in the actual hallway of the school, where, where they're at in the actual school building. But was there ever any thought given to, at least you know, as the contract is now um, for the next year, having SROs operate kind of be on campus, but not necessarily in the building unless they're actually called? Because like I said, I've heard that comment from a lot of people about the presence in the building really being a weight on the shoulder of our students. And so, and, but you got a building of several hundred people, it might not hurt to have someone on call right there if a situation arises. And so I guess that's just what I'm trying to get at. Has that been considered, is that possible? So I, I know that that has been part of the discussion. I think that there is, um, so I appreciate the term. I don't know if you actually used it this way, Director Mershbrack or Director Borchening, of a replacement behavior when you're looking at, when you take something away, what's, what's the replacement? And so as we were looking at the middle school specifically, the middle school recommendation, that's where we've had a deep conversation is, what might this look like when you remove someone from a building but they might still be accessible to us. What could that look like? And proactively, you know, educating and being being accessible, but also on a reactive end, if there's an emergency, how do we have them accessible? So that's been the deepest part of the conversation. On the front end, Deputy so Superintendent Quaker, anything um, in regards to the conversations beyond that? But it is, I think, a continued conversation. And how what would that look like, sound like, feel like, instead of the current model? I don't think your mic I'm is on. Hold the button. Should be a button. So. Okay. Intentional about the conversations. Yeah, that's definitely on. <laughs> With middle schools, and if they aren't individually at those middle schools, what does that look like to make sure maybe they're available and accessible, but where, where does that go through and what is that communication? So I think that intentionality of knowing if they're spread out and they can just report quickly to buildings without going through, for example, Laurel or myself or somebody that's in charge of seeing, is it really a safety issue where an SRO officer or police officer needs to be involved? We have a, had a lot of intentionality around those conversations of what that looks like. But also just the whole reason we've talked about the uniforms is because we've been hearing from students, some staff, community, parents, right, all across the board of just that traumatic experience and how could we reduce that by putting them in softer uniforms or you know different uniforms so they can still perform their job duties but not necessarily having them as patrolling i guess i would follow up on that and are we going to get more survey data from our students um you know we had the data where we were talking about 25 percent of black students and other groups uh you know <coughs> what percent felt unsafe with the sro I appreciate where we're trying to do with the soft uniform, but I'd like to see the results of what people actually feel if that's the route that we did end up going because kids are still going to know who that person is um, in the building. So mm -hmm. are we going to measure that at some later date? Um, is that will be that part of that metrics that come to us? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We've talked about keeping the same surveys in place and measuring to see improvement and comparing where we were, you know, this past year to where are we coming this next year with that data, especially the panorama mm -hmm. survey. Black Student Union survey, even the community survey, to see what the outcomes are, especially when we're sharing data and hopefully showing some of those improvements around the metrics we're looking at. And, and as the data comes to us or the feedback comes to us, we can add to get more specific feedback as well if a question's not getting at exactly what it is that we are seeking. Yeah. Well, and I think it's really important when you're receiving the data, the sooner that we as a board could receive the information uh, that would be helpful because we want to see if it's working or if it's not working and what we need to do because I think sometimes what happens it's delayed and delayed and then we're we're clueless to, to what is going on so that will be very key to depending on uh, what we decide that that information is going to be so important to us as a board we call that formative data in the education world to lead to summative uh, uh, data recommendations. So we will keep the formative data certainly um, prioritized. This is, I, so this is a, 
this is just a comment, I guess, from Noreen. Uh, so I've had the great privilege of serving our district. Um, this is now my fifth year in our district. And I can't think of a topic that has come to the board table um, and the board has dedicated more time around other than perhaps the facility master plan. Um, that So thank you for being so intentional and keeping this as a priority of a conversation. Uh, it is taking a lot of time and I know there's a great sense of urgency from many different um, uh, parts of our community and um, just for the board to dedicate this much time to thoughtfully reflect and uh, provide input. Uh, I know I greatly appreciate that uh, as superintendent, uh, but I think our community greatly has appreciated having the multiple opportunities to come speak to you about this very topic. Is there a timeline for that formative data when it would be presented? Like how often to the board, how often would we see it? So I think, I know that we will be able to have um, probably every four to six weeks some of the formative reports. And so we could provide that to the board um, via an update um, and absolutely would make that consistently uh, coming back to um, your you all for information. And then you all could actually decide how you might want that presented um, in the future. Thank you. Any other questions from the board? Um, we're to move to learning and leadership, and I'm going to ask Deputy Superintendent and Executive Director John Rice, because we are getting late in the evening. I know you're ready to jump up. <laughs> <We're not. laughs> if we could, in fact, delay your presentation until the 27th because it is getting late in the evening, and uh, I wanted to know if that was okay with the two of you. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Uh, and thank you. Thank you for making that, uh, that adjustment. Uh, so with no further business, we stand adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you, President Humboldt.